The United States, like its average inhabitant, is big. That a single group of people, called Americans, may claim sovereignty to the desert southwest, to the Great Plains, to the Mississippi River, to the Rocky Mountains, and to the Appalachian Range all at one time is one of humanity's greatest stories. But before there was any America to be populated by the Americans, this area was home to hundreds of groups of tribal peoples that can be roughly sorted into broad civilizations, defined mostly by the lifestyles induced by their regional geography. The indigenous American peoples, Indians as they were later identified, of the Great Plains lived nomadic lives, chasing their food in an area where water would not provide stationary nutrition for free. Travel a thousand or so miles west, and the Columbia River of modern-day Washington state invited fishing communities to feast upon salmon-filled streams in the Pacific Northwest. These tribes experienced mostly undisturbed histories well into the second millennium. The same could not be said for the most settled region of the pre-colonial American West, the Desert Pueblos. These people were happened upon by a group of foreigners they must have found perplexing, to say the least. Spaniards, coming from alien lands across an ocean, had conquered Central and South America's greatest civilizations in less than a century, and established the most tyrannical and formidable empire ever witnessed by the Americas' native inhabitants. North America was the next horizon, but in a sharp juxtaposition with the luscious population centers of Mexico, this land seemed to contain nothing but mud houses and farms dotted along vast expanses of sand and desert. De Soto's brutal journey throughout the southeast Mississippi region and Coronado's slightly less brutal journey into the southwest came in search of golden, wealthy cities, but ultimately achieved little. Yet they did presage the long decline of local native tribes, for the discovery of the Americas was an encounter of two peoples which couldn't differ more. The Spanish state had mastered the art of governance, possessed exceptional military technology, and was home to the world's finest navigators. The Puebloans did not have any of these intricacies, their societies respected kinship above the arbitrary state. The scant archaeological evidence we can gather from this time signifies a political prestige economy. Goods and artifacts that symbolized power and honor flowed out from a superlative city and odd nearby villages into loyalty. But this was nothing like a state. After all, it's hard to enforce a monarch's iron will when their only method of exercising power is distributing Mexican imported feathers. The Indians often noted European recklessness in terms of handling the gifts of Earth. Europeans believed their land was a resource, natives believed their land was a home. Spaniards believed that God was one, he had a scripture, he was omnipotent, and all was ordained by him, including their subjugation of the natives. Indians believed in more earthly gods that existed in nature. Ultimately, both civilizations did not know how to comprehend each other. Some Spaniards theorized this was because natives were guerrillas hiding in plain sight. Modern scholars consider this unlikely. The first Spanish attempts to permanently settle North America were done by Franciscan missionaries, a religious order of evangelizing mobile Christians who appealed their messages to the urban poor, with the only lasting settlements being Santa Fe in New Mexico and St. Augustine in Florida. The missionary settlers took to assimilating the natives into Spanish religion, keeping secular military oppression at an arm's length in exchange for their own, punishing dearly non-Christian customs. Though this system was progressive compared to its antecedent, mass genocide, it nonetheless angered many. Spanish North America was in for a rebellion. Several factors led up to the upheaval of the 1680s through 1700s. Missionaries quarreled with official Spanish jurisdiction and crown-appointed administrations. Spaniards hardly had any authority to talk of moral salvation when their religion couldn't stop hundreds of millions of deaths from disease and served as a tool for oppression. Native assaults on Spanish settlements started off unorganized and were quickly extinguished. Yet a few years of crop failure and droughts marked the beginning of revolts which would bring Spanish New Mexico to its knees in the 1680s. These rebellions succeeded quickly in expelling Christian missions and almost had enough time to completely erase Spanish progress towards Christianization of the Indians, but the region was reconquered by the cunning Diego de Vargas in 1692. Never again would the Spanish try so hard to establish an iron grip over North America. At most, the average Pueblo Indian was left a syncretic believer of traditional religion and Christianity. Figures like Jesus and Mary incorporated into his pantheon alongside spirits and deities of their nature-based faiths. The Indians, however, would come to be the least of Spain's North American worries. The French situated themselves at the mouth of the Mississippi River and would conduct trading operations that introduced Indians to metal tools, advanced weaponry, and a rich beaver fur trade. The English established affluent and militarily threatening colonies on what is now the American East Coast. That a plundering Anglo-Native alliance trounced the already struggling Spanish mission system in Florida in the 1680s was a clear-as-daylight reminder that Spain could not ignore her colonial competitors. A large-scale assault on the Spanish North American Empire came in the War of the Quadruple Alliance, and it was not met ineffectively. Spaniards settled the region now called Texas to serve as a permanent buffer between their territories and French Louisiana. The Spanish must have thought they had eliminated their British adversaries as well when a seemingly forlorn rebellion in the Thirteen Colonies, with their aid, produced an independent revolutionary nation. 
this was not the case. Instead, they got what must have been Britain on steroids. Spain turned immediately to native tribes as a way to shield their brittle empire from the ineluctable advance of American pioneers. The regulations of 1772 and instructions of 1786 introduced European military codes of contact to the New World, and laid out three principles in dealing with the natives. Constant military pressure, alliance making, and gifts and trade to ensure loyalty. For a while, this saw a period of brief peace and prosperity in North America, but the Spanish Empire's already milquetoast reputation as a trustworthy ally was seriously undermined when it decided to blow up in the 1810s and 20s. Suddenly, independent Mexico inherited the Southwest region settlements. Of course, they first had to fight a bloody and economically catastrophic revolution. Mexico's economy and population was all but stagnant for three quarters of a century afterward. The northern frontier had quite ambivalent attitudes towards the struggle mainly fought to their south. Some provinces, like Texas, which had its population cut in three, embraced independence enthusiastically and were seen as pivotal regions by both sides. Others, like California, whose burgeoning mission system had been cut off from the rest of New Spain by native assault, were isolated from the whole ordeal and rather apathetic about its outcome. It is telling that these areas only held independent celebrations after being given a decree from Mexico City saying they had to. Still, optimism took hold in the minds of many frontiersmen. Perhaps the first tracks of a road to racial equality and self-government had been paved. Northern regions were given their first political representation by the relatively liberal constitution of 1824, but the struggle that came with this was finding enough capital among their piss-poor populations just to have one man travel to the National Assembly in Mexico City on a regular basis. Democracy just seemed too overpriced. Ultimately, international interference, stubborn opposition from political traditionalists, and scant political experience doomed the liberal government. It was during rule by conservatives who tried to restructure Mexico's government into a more centralized model that the northern frontier fell apart. This was not by their own doing. Factors way beyond Mexico City's control were already beginning to reorient the southwest away from Central America. Upon coming to power, however, centralists began stripping the north of its autonomy and restricted eligibility for elections to the non-poor, who turned out to be non-existent as well. The judiciary was a textbook example of a broken system. Local courts were expensive, effective courts were far away, and the experienced lawyer population was paltry. The next thing the conservatives tried and failed to do was reinvigorate the decaying northern mission system. The anti-clericalism of the 1820s liberal regime was the coup de grace to the north's already strained spiritual and political institutions. Mission lands were secularized, and it was hoped that priests would exercise their role as community leaders in less oppressive ways. This ideal was very much complicated by the passing of various laws which tried to expel the Spanish-born population between 1827 through 35, a population to which much of the clergy belonged. The missions, for all their unethical religious practices, were the backbone of local economies and the main political organizations of the North. Perhaps this region just wasn't ready for secularism, as it seemed only God himself could convince poor, hapless souls to move to northern Mexico. Well, not entirely. Even if your homeland is poor, backwater, unstable, and hazardous, that won't stop it from being invaded by Americans. One of the cardinal causes of the Mexican Independence War was a desire to break free from the paralyzing influence Spanish mercantilism had upon a Mexican economy competing with an increasingly dynamic world. Now, the North was under the influence of the less debilitating but still imposing American capitalist economy. Migrants from the United States flooded in, and in most economic aspects they were a great boon to the region, bringing financial institutions and working alongside the native Mexican population in the emerging, but modest, industries of skilled artisanry, mining, and beaver trapping. Yet many of North Mexico's new arrivals didn't plan for the region to remain North Mexico. The ineffective protectionist policies approved for the region by the government in central Mexico were seen by many Americans as a deliberate attempt to restrict freedom and enforce Mexican nationality upon the settlers, though in reality they were more a result of poor economic judgment, not ulterior motives. Nonetheless, the frontier benefited massively from its proximity to the states, and a large portion of the population believed they would lift a massive burden by escaping the Mexican national boundary. Central Mexico had been devastated by the Independence War and came out of it at the helm of a predatory, corrupt, oversubsidized military establishment. What future did they have in this country? So was raised the Lone Star Flag, and many others, during a series of rebellions throughout the 1830s and 40s. The Texan Revolution was, by far, the largest and most politically significant. 35,000 Americans, led by settlers given Mexican government land grants like Stephen Austin, had arrived in the region. The majority owned slaves and were practicing Protestants, both antithetical to Mexico's laws and identity. Few expressed genuine desire to enter into the national fold of this Central American nation. 
One revolutionary leader, Sam Houston, cited lawlessness and the lack of order as the rebelling Americans' primary grievance that led to secession in 1835. In reality, it was feared that Mexico would attempt to assert control over the region that was the impetus for insurrection. The Texans rose up to defend their basic human freedoms against tyrannical government, but more importantly, white people's basic human freedoms against tyrannical government. One nation turned out to be very sympathetic to their cause, whose own independent struggle the Texans admired greatly and tried to model their revolutionary mythos after. The American experiment is a famous and increasingly infamous phrase today. The United States is peculiar in not being defined as a nation of folks who speak the same language, share the same origins, or do the same things, but as a nation that ventured forth into world history with an always reinterpreted and oft-criticized national ethos of liberty and freedom. At least, that's according to those who champion the Republic as a general good to the world. But politicians of the USA very often wonder whether they should be a beacon of freedom, an exemplary enlightened nation, or an empire of freedom, a republic taking the initiative and spreading its own national formula. As for what this freedom really entailed, the early American national character is best described as a happy marriage of piety, fecundity, and individualism. Supporters of an empire of freedom were the primary drivers of westward expansion. Early America had a 90 to 80% rural population, which entailed much poverty, but US citizens had an endless reserve of something few other places did, land. Independence from economic reliance on your peers was a saving grace to the average impecunious farmer. It's no wonder they looked for more land, particularly in the wide-open grassy oasis to their west, starting with the area east of the Mississippi. This region was pretty much up for grabs prior to the American Revolution, but after being annexed to the United States, the land was divided up into a repeatable grid pattern of square parcels which were auctioned off at about $1 per acre, a price that proved too high for many. Immediately, you could see signs of the themes that would come to be ubiquitous with the American pioneering west. This land was a place of great cultural exchange between Indians and Europeans, but the latter group decisively won sovereignty over the area in the War of 1812 and subsequent migration wave. The Northwest frontier was diverse, settlers constantly discovering new innovations that could best exploit the land's natural resources, but the Southwest frontier was dominated by slavery. Racial inequality was omnipresent. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson acquired from Emperor Napoleon the primary artery of North American civilization, the Mississippi River. The next regions of American settlement didn't follow a linear path forward. Many people, among them many missionaries and many New Englanders, took their American values all the way to the Pacific Ocean and settled in Oregon. If these settlers just had in mind some nice simple evangelizing and the valiant defense of Christianity against other forms of Christianity, other groups had more utopian ideals. Mormons were the most notable. With the death of the movement's prophet, Joseph Smith, many Americans gleefully expected this eccentric group to decay into obscurity, and history seemed to be against the Latter-day Saints. The Mormon hierarchy, however, devised a new direction for the movement. They would make an exodus to a land of God's choosing out west, a new Zion filled to the brim with active rivers, fertile soil, lush meadows, bright flowers, er, sorry, the, the Utah Desert. The trek to this new land was trying enough, but when they made it to found the city of Salt Lake City, they immediately faced the threat of intervention from an eastern United States highly disgusted with their theology. Not all of the westward pull was religious, some parts of it were implicitly political. A few early access versions of Vladimir Lenin even tried to build socialist utopias in human backwaters. Despite the stereotypes of the American West as full of rural nomadic cowboys, many settlers in reality flocked to the sporadically appearing urban centers such as Salt Lake City, Denver, San Francisco, or Los Angeles. Though these cities were viewed by Easterners as disorderly in architecture, and as many cities do, fell victim to gang violence, racial tension, and disease, they continued to attract many new migrants for their diverse economic opportunities and wide variety of religious institutions. As for westward expansion on the national level, the only logical places to proceed were contested by foreign powers. The Texan Rebellion struggled in the southwest. Despite a strong victory at the Battle of San Jacinto, the Texan-Mexican border continued to see many skirmishes, and even reinvasions of Texas at times. Meanwhile, to the north, a flurry of American settlers were arriving in the Oregon Country region after the opening of the Oregon Trail, many expressing a desire that the entirety of the Pacific Northwest become American. Both of these crises came to a head in the presidency of Democrat James K. Polk. 
Although his inauguration speech contained fiery rhetoric about how the United States was entitled to aggrandize claims in Oregon, the uproar this caused when heard in Britain forced him to compromise a few American aspirations, such as the south of Vancouver Island and settle upon the 49th parallel for America's border on the mainland. The issue of Texas, in contrast, was not going to be settled peacefully. When the United States annexed the rebelling Mexican province on December 29, 1845, the time had come for Mexico to enforce its northern border, as had the time come for Americans to beat up some Mexicans. This they did. Deciding what they were fighting Mexico for was a far greater challenge to the United States than the Mexican army. Southerners desired greatly for the expansion of slavery coast to coast, following closely the march of republicanism and Protestant Christianity the rest of the nation so yearned for. Some Americans proposed outright annexing the whole Mexican nation. The Polk administration rejected this plan with the impeccable argument that Mexico had too many Negroes in it. The first of the newly annexed territories to be the recipient of an immigration wave was the Golden State of California, which attracted people precisely because of its namesake. The gold rush made a few early arrivals wealthy who found the abundant surface-level gold strips and had to only put in modest work to make themselves a stack of cash, but the more miners searched, the harder it became to churn out profit. Thus centers wage contracts, collective mining operations, industrial technology, and urban settlement, most notably in the region's largest city, San Francisco. News of the discovery of gold, happening in the midst of one of many great communications revolutions, quickly spread across the world and attracted a very cosmopolitan settler population. Unfortunately, this diversity became a lightning rod for racial tension and even genocide. Despite the influx of settlers, California was still a far-flung outpost, the local military administration ineffective enough to leave justice in the region determined by vigilantes, but many people saw clear impetus in the California gold rush to connect the two sides of the country. This became a reality in the 1860s, when the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869 with much help from explosives, Chinese and Irish immigrants, as well as some dubious business practices. The two ends of the country had been united. The West had just moved a little east. Yet with regards to dubious business practices that became all too common among industrialists who looked to the frontier, the Western working class responded by forming several labor syndicates and organizations. This corporation-labor conflict would coalesce into a vigilante civil war. Some fought for social order on the side of corporations, others for populism against elitist Republican Party businesses. Still, others fought for socialism and workers' rights, others to protect their industry, others to protect their rights as ethnic minorities. Though the West is often seen as a rowdy and unrestrained new frontier of humanity, the fate of the Western pioneers was linked inextricably with the economic sway of regions east. A change in European fashion taste diminished Oregon's beaver fur industry, and cattle farming grew precisely because of the rise of steak as the quintessential American delicacy out east, to name a few examples. Western industry was, keeping in trend with all other aspects of the area, violent. There were clashes between labor unions and employers, craftsmen unionists and industrial unionists, white people who hated capitalism and immigrants who hated capitalism, and who could forget the closest America ever got to race war, when cow ranchers and sheep ranchers started shooting each other to find out which was the best farm animal. The religious scene of the American frontier was comparatively tolerant. America was one of the first nations to secularize. That might imply that the United States was the first government to separate itself from religion, but faiths in America were really the first religions to separate themselves from the government. Precisely because religion was private and you had to be convinced to believe, there developed no clerical establishment on the frontier. Mormons created their own Zion, Protestants evangelized throughout the region in an attempt to safeguard from a Catholicism that dominated former Mexican territories as a Hispanic folk religion, and there were plenty of zealously radical denominations flaring up as a part of the American Great Awakening. Non-Christian faiths also experienced success. Jewish migrants from Central Europe situated themselves as influential merchants and community leaders in Western areas, while Native American faiths appeared largely as responses to Christian encroachment. Notably, there was the Ghost Dance Movement, with the inspirational message that you could do a dance and the gods would kill white people. It didn't work, and Native resistance would be buried soon enough. Some Indian rebellions were put down by the military and massacres, other tribes had a major natural component of their lives extinguished, such as the buffalo, and many other natives saw themselves deracinated, their livelihoods altered so utterly or assimilation forced upon them. Whenever a new piece of land was made up for grabs, or a new industry flourished in an already discovered region, it more often than not spelled the death of the local native tribes. The Indians gradually capitulated to spasmodic white settler influxes outside their control, culminating in symbolic major defeats such as the Wounded Knee Massacre. As the rest of the world was in a steampunk-like era of technological innovation, and mankind was mastering a new aspect of science every decade, the West became a last bastion of independence and wilderness. 
Yet, ironically, the people most pulled to the West's wide open spaces were those who wanted to destroy wilderness and fill it with a more tame kind of life. At the turn of the century, populist and radical ideas gained by. Some of these political experiments were undoubtedly misguided, such as prohibition. Some reforms were part of humanity's most applaudable progressions, such as women's suffrage. Some Westerners supported women's suffrage because, being outnumbered two to one on the frontier, women were treated as a rarity that deserved utmost respect. Some gave women the vote as a natural continuation of cultural egalitarianism. Mormons gave women the vote because most of them weren't immigrants. By the 1920s, however, the region took a rightward turn as the socialist margins of radicalism were stamped out by the nationalistic wave that hit when the United States entered World War I. The Ku Klux Klan established many successful Western and chapters that exploited nativist, anti-Catholic, and anti-Semitic sentiment. This didn't stop federal management from taking over the West with the advent of the Great Depression in the 1930s. FDR's New Deal in the West, which entailed, like for the rest of the country, a great amount of economic planning and public works, followed a tradition of Western federal friendship that traced its origins back to Theodore Roosevelt's conservation efforts. When World War II hit, there was racial and economic upheaval. Voices of ethnic minorities such as Mexicans, Jews, and especially the Japanese were sidelined. The military was handed a commanding presence in Western states, who turned increasingly away from archaic mining booms towards economies that produced more modern commodities, like oil and tourist traps. The frontier was no longer a frontier, nor was it even a special expanse of America. It was now a vital national security interest. It was a political battleground. It had economic hotbeds and rural plains. It had bustling metropolises with bright lights and media institutions galore, just like the rest of the nation. Men and women striving to escape their monotonous business-oriented lives out east had created nothing but more centers for monotonous business-oriented lives. Wilderness was not a feature of the frontier, but an antithesis of it. The people who really treasured the West for its grandiose geography, natural beauties, or sacred features were almost exterminated by settlement. The peoples that did not kowtow to massive bureaucracies were fought with soft and hard power by the dignified and sophisticated European pioneers. What images are conjured up in your head by the word pioneer probably represent all the things that pioneers stood to replace. In the end, we must find it at least a little ironic that the American West would come to be idealized for everything that it destroyed. This land is your land, and this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me.